Hi everybody. I'm trying to get back in the swing of things and I hope you understand that I took a short break. I have a situation where my anniversary, Christmas, New Year's, and my birthday are all in like a 17 day period and so um, we've just been celebrating like crazy and today I am going to start uh, talking about my sewing machine and also what features I would look for to be able to do the kind of work that, that I'm doing and that I'm featuring in the videos and um, also going to talk a little bit about what's coming next. I had a post on Facebook a while ago that is actually pinned to the top of my page and I'm trying to uh, honor those commitments as I go and um, so that's what's going on. It's the 950. They don't make this machine anymore but so many people ask about it all the time that I thought I'd make a quick video. But what I wanted to say about the manual is your manual should look like this. It should, in my opinion, it should have dog-eared pages. It should have notes. I recommend you actually read your manual. Um, and if you have an older machine, you can usually find the manual online to read it and sometimes even print it. Sometimes you can order one. The English part is only 20 pages, including the index. So, you know, make a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and, you know, familiarize yourself with what each of these things are. In fact, I was looking at mine earlier and realized that there's a thread cutter on my machine that I've never used. <laughs> And it's right there, conveniently located for when you're filling your bobbin. So, read your manual. So this is the Bernina 950, which goes 2,000 stitches per minute, twice as fast as my other Bernina. It has an integrated table with uh, a surface area that is 47 inches by 20 inches, and then you can see that I have two other tables that are made to sit right up against it and extend my sewing space so that I can work on the wall hangings that I like to do. Right now I have a lamp attached on the left side which I've never done before. If I work on something big I probably will have to move that over to the right side because I don't like to have anything over there to catch on. But for smaller work and for shooting having a light on that side is good. Individual features of the sewing machine. There's a nice little drawer for keeping your needles and your feet or anything you want in there. And it actually had a corner on it that was so sharp I kept scraping myself. So I could probably file that, but I just put duct tape on there years ago. There's an integrated lamp that you can move around and you just need to make sure it's not too close to your thread because your thread will catch on this coil neck and it can cause skip stitches as well as actually break your thread or pull and cause trouble. Speaking of the thread, mine holds three different cone threads and Scooby-Doo and uh, it's where I keep my tape measure so I can always find them and the Thread pull on the comb thread is really helpful when you're doing uh, large quantities of an item or even for free motion quilting because while you'll have to change your bobbin constantly, you don't have to change out your top spool unless you want to switch colors. I often will sew through 40 bobbins uh, easily in a sitting before I take a break and so it's nice if you can just have that comb go and go and go and not have to also change that. And not have to keep changing it too when you're filling bobbins. The main part of the machine, which most of us consider to be the sewing machine, is called the head. And it pulls out of the machine and so when you have it worked on, uh, in many cases, you just take that in and don't take in your table. Um, my husband does that for me. 
This red part here is called the knee lift, and if you look at the foot, it'll lift it up even further than it normally goes to really stick something in there. It'll lower it, and if you're doing napkins or pop holders or anything where you're constantly turning corners, it's really good to learn how to use this. Hidden under here, this metal piece is the fan belt. This is the flywheel. It was pretty scraped up when I got my machine, and it's gotten more scraped up in the years since. Behind that knee lift is the clutch motor. This is what I was talking about those thousands of times that I told people in my booth that I had half a horse under the table. Also the reason that I would tell people that my sewing machine is a real power tool. I started to think about sewing machines a lot differently after I got this one. My husband asked me to make sure that I show you how the motor is as big as the head on this machine. <laughs> so, something I never even thought about, but he spent a lot more time under this sewing table than I have. This is the needle guard that came on my machine and the first thing I did was take it off. This might be part of it too, I'm not sure. Um, don't try this at home. This is meant to keep your fingers away from the needle and the foot. And I took mine off. But it was in my little drawer, so I thought I'd show it to you. Here I am pretending that I wear shoes in the sewing room. I usually sew barefoot or in, in socks or slippers. But this machine has a hair trigger. And when I first got it, it was sort of all open. And you can, when you're going, you can break with your heel. It stops almost immediately. But the needle, the needle may be up or down. It doesn't discriminate. It just does it. And the boards behind there that you see are the invention of my husband's. When I first got the machine, it was so all out, all or nothing, that he made boards that I don't even know how he puts them under there, but he puts them under there for me, which he hasn't done yet. And uh, it makes it so that when I push on one side of the pedal, which I don't even remember which is which, but I intuitively do it right when I'm, when I'm sewing, one side of the pedal and it tends to go slow and one side of the pedal it tends to go much faster. Also, the base of my machine is on four casters and these are really hard on your feet if you bump into them or uh, step on them. And so I always push them underneath so that they're hidden as much as possible in place. This is my list of the key features that are nice to have as you're exploring raw edge applique and intuitive sewing. And some of them should be pretty self-explanatory, especially after uh, the look we just had at my machine. But I'm going to add a few things, not necessarily uh, the same order that they're on the list. And we're gonna look at the feet that came with my machine. I will talk about the two series I'm planning to start right away. Whatever kind of machine you have, if you can have some kind of extended sewing space, it's very helpful for doing this kind of work. And then you don't have all that drag and pull when you're working with layers, especially if you're working unbasted. And so there are acrylic tables like this one, and there are also uh, some videos on YouTube where people, uh, and elsewhere on the internet, where people show how you can make a makeshift extended table using foam insulation and that sort of thing. And so you can experiment with anything like that in order to make the best quilting setup for yourself as you uh, expand your skills. Of course all of this assumes that you have basic 
free motion quilting capability, which at the bare minimum is the ability to drop your feed dogs, and that's this part of the machine here, which marches your fabric when the machine is going. See that? That's what moves your fabric back as you're feeding through. And so to drop them, you'll have some sort of a switch on your machine and it will pop them down. And then when you do this, they don't do that. They're moving a little, but not enough. They're lowered and they're gonna move, but they're not gonna move your fabric. And then the other component that you need is that darning foot. And when it goes on that needle bar, it doesn't press down really hard. It is a little bit higher, I believe, than uh, most of the other feed. And it will allow you to move your fabric so that you're essentially gliding over the top of the fabric with this. And that's what allows you to free motion quilt. And so the basic two things you need right here. So while we're at it, let's take a look at these feet that my machine came with. This is the darning foot that I just talked about. And it's critical for free motion quilting. And I wouldn't even try without it. This is the foot you probably end up using the most unless you free motion quilt a ton. And that's just your regular zigzag foot and it's the one you use for your regular straight stitch. And that's a workhorse. My next most valuable foot is this, which is this edger. It's actually called a blind hem foot, but I use it mostly for edging and so I call it an edger. After that, probably the most valuable foot to me is the zipper foot because I do zippers. And then after that, um, we get to the feet that I don't really use that much. I occasionally will do a bit of satin stitching or uh, kind of couching where I sort of use the embroidery foot and I've never used my overlock foot because I have a serger and I have avoided buttonholes successfully for quite some time. But those are the feet and the ones that I cannot live without are these four. These three. They just make the difference. When we talk about the throat of a machine, this is what we're talking about. The distance from the needle to this part of the machine. And so how big your work can be when you stick it in there. And so mine is not that big. Looks like less than seven and a half inches to me. The two things you want to look for are the width of your zigzag. This goes up to four millimeters. So if I put this on the widest stitch for zigzag, that's how wide I can do a satin stitch for my decorative quilting. Right there. And if I'm needing to move my needle, it has five positions. So then it's in the center and it'll go to the left, one, two, and then to the right, one, two. And those are the five positions. And those spread apart that same four millimeters. So it turns out we've come all this way just to talk about the auto up down needle function on a sewing machine. If you have a fancy computerized machine 
with auto up down. It likely also has a motherboard controlling not only that function but all of the other great things it does. In which case you'll want to be careful with your projects and try to do workarounds that we'll talk about with the projects to do fewer layers. In fact, I got my big machine because I had a machine that was in danger of uh, me crashing the motherboard because I was going through more and more layers all the time and I bent my needle bar. And so it's a trade-off and you just need to decide uh, how much you think your machine can handle and what you can do differently in order to minimize the thickness because with Raya Edge Applique you can just keep building it up and building it up and building it up and I sometimes like to just put four or five layers of fabric on top of everything else and quilt a shape into that and then when you trim the edge and wash it it gets a nice felted look around the edge but that is not recommended for most domestic machines and even a bent needle bar is enough to ruin your day and it may break your budget that week or month depending on the situation and so um, I'm trying to say that while auto up down is a nice feature most machines that have it are not going to be what you want if you really start building up your layers to do this but you can do beautiful designs and never go through more than six layers of fabric that are flat and trimmed away in most places and a thin layer of batting and so that's what I'd like you to think about while you're working and planning your projects and deciding how much you want to do with this.